It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. <laughs> I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> That's the most quiet anyone has ever been through the theme song. It's focused and I was taking listening. it in, man. <laughs> it's been a while since we've sat and heard it in the earphones, yeah. hasn't no, it? No, it's nice. Sometimes hey, it's nice to just let it absorb. Yeah, right? Let it soak in. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club, the show where we talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of high strangeness. I am your host, Michael McMillan. With me always is your other host... Bryce Johnson. And our super producer... Riley Bright. Guys, it's the middle of summertime and it's getting hot <laughs> up yeah. in the canyon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bryce, I wanted to talk to you because you texted me earlier okay. and you told me that you finally saw Ari Aster's Midsummer. Yeah. What did you think? Dude, fucking crazy, man. Isn't that movie great? Look, my wife's been out of town with the kids for the last four days, so I've been at home in my underwear watching Bigfoot movies, <laughs> alien movies, and I was like, I'm going to take myself out and watch a crazy movie my wife would never go to. I wish you would call me because I really want to see it a second time. Oh, yeah. And I totally would have gone with you. Man, I've just been uh, I've been enjoying some me time, man. But it was fu- it, the movie was amazing, man. I, you know, I, it, when I first watched watched it my first response was oof i'm a little disappointed because i loved hereditary and hereditary scared the fuck out of I'm me i'm going to watch that shit tonight and midsummer is maybe a little too close to the original Wicker Man from mm. the 70s, if you've seen that no, one. No, but I was trying to remember the name of the one Dude, I wanted to see. Yeah, it's, I want to see to, Wicker Man. It might be a little <clears throat> too close to it, but it okay. is. But in the days that followed, I could not stop thinking about that film. Yeah, right. And I just kept going. I read, started reading all the articles and all the interviews that I Ari read Azzer articles done. too. Yeah. Um, our, our guest who I'm about to bring in is smiling big. So, Maybe he he's just do it, he, man. Just bring him well, in, man. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, but before yes. we do that, I also took myself out to a movie yesterday, and I saw for the first time in the seventy millimeter road show part of the Tarantino festival that was happening at the Cinerama, Cinerama Dome. Oh, oh and, awesome. uh, in the heart of Hollywood, I saw uh, the Hateful Eight. For I hadn't oh, seen it, I missed great it. One. Yeah, I don't I know why. One. Very good. All right, we got to bring in our guest. Uh, this he is wants an, to comment yeah, on these films. So this hard. is <laughs> yes. uh, Club Scouts. You're in for a treat because if uh, before there was Bryce Johnson, there was this man that I met on set. Uh, <laughs> very classic film, <laughs> <laughs> uh, known as. The Hills Have Eyes 2, the remake. Oh, no I spent way. Uh, two months in the Moroccan <laughs> desert with this guy, pretending to be a National Guard oh, soldier. My. To look like New Mexico. <laughs> yes. Bring that microphone up to your mouth, you, Oh, you heck yes, giant. Michael. Um, there you go. That's, oh, that's what I love telling good. people. Like, we were in Morocco to look like New Mexico. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, apparently you that's can a get, long way to go for New Mexico. Right, it's right tax there. Breaks. Apparently you can get a like a one point five million dollars more up on the screen. Uh, this guy, you've seen him in a million things. Uh, uh, more recently, he was in Twin Peaks: The Return, which I am so psyched about. A small film called Jurassic World, uh, and he is on the uh, Cartoon Network series We Bear Bears. Awesome, yay! Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. A oh, uh, a delightful and like-minded guest, Eric Edelstein. Yay! Yay. I love. I'm just sitting here smiling because it takes me back to Morocco. Well, I'll tell you what. Because you just, I'd never left the country before. It was terrifying, and Mike just really does have this wonderful leader vibe where I would just follow him, and I felt I was going to live. We we smoked (laughs) a lot of hash. No way! Oh, dude, we buddy. Thank God you can't get Moroccan hash in Los Angeles because I have tried. It's a whole thing, and I've even Googled why it's different. Do you know that the African sun produces a terpene when it is dried on roofs? 
And so that is why Moroccan hash is different because it's a different drug. Right, yeah, they, put, they put it up on the roof. They dude. put it up on the roof, man. We went what? out to the desert. I think for my one of my twenty something birthdays. I don't know. It's been so long now, but we. It was you, me. I think Jacob Vargas. Oh, I love him. Um, Rashad. Rashad, dude, Rashad's the best. Yeah, we went out and we these guys who were our crew members were so fucking cool on this movie. Oh my gosh, we were in the small town called. The Warzazat, which is out in the middle of the Moroccan desert. Wow. And it's like a small town where they built two giant studios that are not very well kept. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of good restaurants. Reek of, no, well, the town's great. The, the, the studios themselves just reeked of sewage. Run by the local, shall we say, you can say mafioso, it. I Mike believe. Mike said it. I found them Very, to be incredible, industrious, they, independent businessmen. I mean, got they it. Were, yeah. With AK-47. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Right. Sammy. The Sammy. Dude, he was... Very great. Stuff got done. Let me tell you this. He was kind <laughs> we of We get mo- stuff done. That's a motto. He was yeah. a very sweet guy. Very cool. Very welcoming. I would describe him as the Moroccan Tony Soprano. I, I, there was at one point in the middle of this seven, eight week shoot, 115 degrees out in the desert. You would drink 10 to 12 bottles of water a day and never pee. Wow. And I remember just when I discovered that they were just dumping all of that all those plastic water bottles like just in a hole in the desert. Oh, sure. And I remember getting so self righteous and being like, I am not gonna be a part <laughs> of a film <laughs> where they're just gonna litter in the desert. And I remember like talk to talking to Sammy and being like, Is there anything I can do to help clean this up? And he was just like you know, uh, patronized me and then rolled his eyes as soon as I walked away, I'm sure. He's like, it helps decompose the bodies that are there next to. <laughs> so yeah. it's, they're good for the bodies, Mike. I can't do anything. But they I like were... how he's an Italian yeah. Moroccan uh, Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the, yeah. the crew was amazing. Amazing. And took, I, I, I celebrated a birthday while we were there and they took us out, drove us out in the middle of the desert. We had like blankets and like just sat out. And tried to the, make love to you? <laughs> under the Moroccan sky. And we just hung out. I think one of us had a guitar. It wasn't me because I don't know how to play. Mm. And then we just like smoked like hash out of a hookah pipe. Sounds nice. And it, it was does. one of the best. It's one of the most memorable nights of my life. I have photos of it still. It is. Great. And without judging, it, it's led to one of my kind of rules I found as character acting. Without judging, movies, sometimes you just make the best friends in the worst movies. Mm, exactly. Wow. Because you're all in there. And like we were shooting this thing during Ramadan. So people started dropping day two because they can't eat water. They they can't eat. They can't drink. Right. And it's like, oh. are you really saving that much money that these you're having these guys drop these cameras? But it's it's Jeez. real. It's right. Right. And exactly. It's, but, but it's it like for amazing. days too, right? Yeah. And I remember the scariest thing was when our friend Rashad got sick, and they took him to the good hospital. Right. And when we went to check up on him at the good hospital. They didn't have toilet paper, and they didn't have soap, and yeah. they were trying to draw his wow. blood, Whoa. and they went 0 for 7 in front of us, and the guy was putting his thumb uh. on blood spurting out. And He's we, like, <laughs> all right, let me yeah. wait that I, don't, I don't even think he had the courtesy to spit. <laughs> right, right. Unbelievable. No, you couldn't, and you just realize how darn lucky we are here. And he's like, and you remember, know? we're the good hospital. Yeah, we're the good one. That was, it was hey, on we're the, the good side. One. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I remember I was filming and couldn't go to the hospital, but was w- was up to date with all of that stuff. Everyone got sick. I because first of all, just everyone. We were all told not to drink the water because <laughs> because not right. because the, the, the locals can drink the water, but it's because when you go to a different country, yeah, right. you're just not used to the bacteria that's in the water. I just so think it's funny you're in the desert. And they're like, don't drink water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. drink yeah. the you water. You got to drink bottled water. But but that that you know when people there's it's not that the water is dirty there. It's just that your stomach is not acclimated to the local bacteria right. sure. that are that's in the pipes. So but the 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 mistake that everybody made, and I didn't because I think I'm mostly drink beer, <laughs> but was vodka sodas and then putting ice in it and the ice would melt and uh, that's yeah. where everyone got sick. I um, we called it the Zots. Oh, oh I almost gosh. got it one night real bad, but You got the Zots. But I was spending all this time in that stagnant water oh, on buddy. set. Because we were like getting covered, Jessica Stroop and I were getting covered with all this like mud and water. And I, I came down, the director and I both came down with like horrendous bronchitis, like 
we're talking six and a half, seven weeks in. Wow. And I remember that I couldn't, it was so bad I couldn't go to work when I, I was scheduled to shoot basically every day. Six day weeks, by the way. And then I remember that this doctor came in, made a house call, and his way of like treating me was like grabbing me by the collar, <laughs> sitting me up in bed and shaking me and slapping my face <laughs> and then giving me medicine and slapping my back. It was like very oh, I rough. Love that. Like, um but it was You feel better? That's good, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I was okay. Yeah. Listen, I was w- I was back to work the next day and feeling much. You're fantastic better, but- in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The movie is full of great oh, performances, thanks. friends. Oh my but God. I will say this, Mike, and this is the segue into the paranormal. I had a very serious had a very serious stomach thing, which I'd lie about in physicals for these movies, and I was the only one that did not get a stomach ailment over there. Oh wow! And then I remember Mike pulled me out. And he showed me the pictures that he'd taken of me over there. We got one role developed. He's like, look, you're surrounded by orbs and all these pictures. Every fucking picture what? was I Eric. I felt weirdly protected over there. And it's bizarre. I've talked about it on the podcast, but I'm like, you, I had Crohn's disease at the time. And oh, wow. I was, I didn't and, know. Yeah. And, they, and I would lie about it in physicals and all this other stuff. Yeah. And I'm probably looking back to be the one person threatening a stomach thing. Yeah. But man. I was surrounded by How orbs. Did you get through- wow. I didn't get sick once. Well, I didn't open my mouth in the shower. I didn't eat the lettuce, yeah. which that that was really just a lifestyle <clears throat> choice Everybody, at that point. Yeah, true. <laughs> that wasn't like, well, I think I'll <laughs> smile. I to, I'm like, I ain't I, eating that. I have to avoid lettuce. <laughs> yeah. Now. No. Whoops. You Sen- know what? You- Sentient entities wanted you in Hills Have Eyes too. That's it, buddy. Yeah. I That's think, it. I think what saved plan. me was not orbs, but I actually, the looking back, I went, oh, I did that and I shouldn't have. I brushed my teeth with the tap water oh. but i never swallowed it and so i think i got acclimated over time that's smart. to the water mm, that's so smart buddy. i would maybe do that again next time um but w- i forgot about the orbs the orbs man. i have those photos somewhere i should know we gotta them find them and then I, I, we, I know where they are I know mike the and i'd be on. sitting in the desert t- talking about art bell yes this is lamenting why I was like, george nori uh, <laughs> mike would do the greatest george nori impression we'd have these rough moments on set anyone who doesn't like a woman should be locked up <laughs> <laughs> and he would just bust that out when we needed a little bit of morale <laughs> Yeah. And it was just the greatest. We would talk about Art Bell and all these conspiracies and everything else. I was like, this is glorious. Brian Amazing. Bryce Johnson, Eric oh, Edelstein man. was the <laughs> one other actor that wow. I could hang out with on set and talk about the paranormal with. And uh, it was so great. I'm so glad you're finally on the show. Uh, I'm yeah. so excited to be here and just, just talking to you about a little, do you really... Not know about the secret bunker and base in Laurel Canyon. We're is gonna this get, true? We're, it's true. Bryce? No. I don't. Holy shit. We're going to get to that. No. That's a good tease. But before we do, ladies and gentlemen, we have some... Bay 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 news. Oh, All right, geez. guys. So I... I feel, feel every time it's funny. That. I know well, it's still makes me laugh. <laughs> so I want to apologize to any anime or manga fans out there. Apparently, I was mispronouncing Naruto... Oh, uh, wow. when we were talking about sure the Naruto, yeah. Naruto, Naruto run on Area 51 uh, last week. Eric, do you know about this story? Yeah, dude. So uh, uh, anyway, I figured I, I had to double check uh, the pronunciation of it. And how did I learn that I was saying it wrong? Because I watched a three minute YouTube video where a furry taught me how to correctly pronounce it. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's dressed in a f- fox full Disneyland style fox costume. Okay. He's British. Um, I should know his name. I'll figure it out. We don't need um, it. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> took, he We're just good. he needed to take three and a half minutes to teach people how <clears throat> to pronounce this one uh, anime character's name. So as we talked about last week with Jen Kirkman, there's a Facebook post went up called uh uh let storm area 51 let's it's see them aliens cheek. let's see them aliens it's tongue in cheek and the poster wrote if we naruto 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 run at full speed they won't be able to stop us and so this is an anime character uh from comics uh, manga and uh animation where he runs full speed with his head first and his arms back to uh, to provide aer- aerodynamics to make him run faster. 
So clearly this is all a joke, but the founder of the uh, of the Let's Storm Area 1 Facebook movement has been unmasked. His name is Maddie Roberts. He lives in Bakers- Bakersfield, California, and unsurprisingly, he is a giant nerd. <laughs> this guy <laughs> is the biggest and I say this in the best with way. love, yeah, in the best yeah, way, absolutely. the biggest Four nerd. nerds in here. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Maddie, you're one of us. Yeah. And I love Bakersfield, he, I, by the way. Yes, yeah, he's yeah, Bakersfield is my Palm Springs. Isn't I really? love it there. I love we it there. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. that. Yeah, we shall. That is Tell us about Maddie. Sort of disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> We've had listeners who've written in being like, Bakersfield is evil. They're probably just um, like, he gets me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fucking I Bakersfield. So Maddie's in his early 20s. He... I th- I believe I'll double check that I couldn't find his age, uh, but uh, he found out about Arif or decided to come up with this after listening to Jeremy Corbell and Bob Lazar's interview with Joe Rogan on his podcast. Yeah, um, but this guy's great. So he gave an interview to local twenty three ABC News in full Naruto uh, cosplay, oh. and I want you guys to take a look if you can and listen to this. I pulled this off no. Twitter off the. Um, so let's just listen to uh, his reaction to this going viral. People kind of want to know what's in there. I think a lot of people are going to show up just because it's kind of a meme. But when people do show up, though, we're, I'm working with some great people. We're planning something really cool out there. So I think last time I checked, it was like 3 million people have RSVP that's either interested or going. So th- it's no small number. There was one gentleman that messaged the page from Denmark and said, I made their local news, which I thought was just completely wild. Awesome. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready. All right. Here he's demonstrating in Naruto <laughs> Run. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ends up in the three, bushes. Yeah, they're not going to get mil- him. They're not going to no. shoot him. No <laughs> fucking he way. Goes. He's fast. Maddie Roberts says he created the event Storm Area 51. They can't stop all of us after listening to two alien enthusiasts on Joe Rogan's podcast in June. Mm -hmm. And we know that those are, of course, Jeremy Corbell and Bob Lazar. The event has gone viral over the last three weeks with more than 1.7 million people now pledging to attend. He said three. Um, I know. Well, I think it's I think there's another half million. Up. And a half I just interested. double whatever number I look at, <laughs> yeah. man. Fuck yeah. So look, this is obviously a joke. Um uh, meant to be a joke, but now, like everything else that's meant to be a joke on Twitter, Sounds like people he's gone. are taking yeah. it seriously. Yeah. Uh, I've heard plans that they might just decide to do a rave <laughs> instead of a rave. <laughs> That'd be fun. Um, yeah. But there's go to there are other stories rave. coming out oh, yeah. on Twitter uh, of uh, rumors that... <laughs> That now the Air Force is being briefed on what Naruto running is. Naruto oh, no, running that's is. Great. Uh, this person posted something. That's a, actual Air Force brief. My All right, cousin, everybody sit down. My, my cousin, Be quiet. My cousin had a sit through. And, you know, uh, Reddit, of course, is saying, well, maybe this was sort of a tongue in cheek thing, you know, that they were doing. But uh, the Air Force has made a comment. Uh, the you have to ask yourself in this situation what is the government go- going to do obviously on Jeremy Corbell's Instagram he had posted uh stuff you know a quote from Bob Lazar you know and I'm paraphrasing but basically saying inst- first of all there's no aliens there well and Bob Lazar said the last guy that tried this got shot so he's right. like you shouldn't do this yeah, that's and not a good idea. uh I heard uh while listening uh last week to last podcast on the left that John L Tenney uh, mm. some uh, paranormal investigator Love that, that we're dude. We're big fans of that in the 90s or early 2000s, Tenny went out there and got too far and they pulled him over and they detained him for hours. Yeah, that information stays car in the and, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, the first of all, this is if you're really thinking about doing this, of course, last week we were like, go for it. No, it's not going to work out for you. This is also so far away from any, from the little alien or any tourist area. You're not going to make it. Um, Friends, <laughs> says you. The military industrial complex <clears throat> is undefeated. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> don't mess around. So, like, I mean, I shake my head at this stuff. I'm like, don't do like, it. Yeah. yeah, but on any given Sunday, yeah. <laughs> any team. 
Uh, how always has a chance, man. <laughs> this, is from, this is from the Washington Post this past Friday. Uh, speaking with the Washington Post, Air Force spokeswoman Laura McAndrew said officials were aware of the event. When asked how authorities would respond to ardent explorers who might attempt to enter Area 51 in September. With deadly make, force. Because this is, I think, <clears throat> it's all supposed to go down like Labor Day weekend. September basically. 20th. Oh, I, okay. My anniversary. A little later. Oh, great. How romantic. I'll bring, bring my wife. wife. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, She'll so, love it. So I have something for you. Yeah, I stand corrected. Yeah. <laughs> this is the anniversary yeah. of your wedding and yeah. your divorce. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> beautiful pierogi. <Yeah. laughs> when asked how authorities would respond to ardent explorers who might attempt to enter Area 51 in September, McAndrews said she could not elaborate on specific plans or security procedures at the base. She did, however, issue a warning to those itching to try their luck. Area 51 is an open training range range for the U.S. Air Force, and we would discourage anyone from trying to come into the area where we train American armed forces, McAndrew said. The U.S. Air Force always stands ready to protect America and its assets. (laughs) Yikes. So, guys, don't do it. Yeah. But also do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm, like, yeah. I'm with the latter. But it is. Go fa- for it. You can I mean, do it, it is fascinating. Uh, with all due credit to Bob Lazar and Jeremy Corbell, like, this is a joke. Like, this is supposed to be tongue in cheek. This, sure. is, this is millennials having fun. Now, of course, there's always the risk risk that someone is going to take it too far yeah um and i guess maddie roberts said that he'd seen other people posting saying that they were ready to take a bullet for this and he's like no 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 no. <laughs> this is a joke this is so supposed to be fun but i think he's now trying to figure out what do i do because people are gonna show up i oh, guess no. i have to go could you imagine the stress of like trying to plan some epic like oh no I, now i got three million people depending <laughs> yeah. on me yeah, well it's, it's gotta know, be fucking huge this is, dude yeah. I, I, think I need I, an alien i need to find an alien I'm Fast. probably not the first to come to this conclusion, but this is like UFOology's fire festival. Yeah, that's right. exactly what this is. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Well, I want to be there. Yeah. I should get Diplo or something. Yeah. Just have a rig, yeah. Listen, you know? there's totally. no reason we can't drive out there on September 20th, dude. You guys, you guys, guys want us to do that? We then should. I be Ten good reasons. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> How many kids do you have? Uh, How many kids do you have? Uh, two. There's two right there. Yeah. 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 That's right. Can you yeah. imagine yeah. if you right. skip your anniversary to go with Riley and uh, me uh, to the Naru- Naruto run? I can't even say it. Anyway, uh, so that's uh, that's the latest update in, on that story. And awesome. As it develops, we will of course um uh keep you guys posted i also wanted to say that i found out today i don't know if you guys heard about this but rosemary ellen guy guiley the um famous uh paranormal investigator she's the author of like 14 or 15 different books on the subject coast to coast regular i Mm -hmm. think she co-wrote uh that book with george nori i think into the light or something like that let me i don't that's it anyone who doesn't love into the light (laughs) should be locked up um she passed away uh, uh, at the oh, age 69 yeah. uh, oh. this week. So, I do remember seeing some about uh, that. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, she was a coast-to-coast regular, so rest in peace. Godspeed. Um, let me see what the name of that book was with uh, um, George Norrie. So you were a big Coast to Coast fan. I was an Art Bell fan. And then I listened to George Norrie when I would get like Taco Bell at 12.30 a.m. Yep. And then you put on 6.40. It was just never the same. Yeah. I saw <laughs> Linda Moulton Howe. In the flesh a couple weeks ago. Oh, no, no way. way. I went to Alien Con. Oh, shit. Oh, awesome. Now, this was, we went because my buddy's dad flew in for this, had weekend passes, but he's a doctor, so he only did one Journey day. Journey into the light. Oh, that's and Journey talk. into the light. <laughs> Journey into the light. <laughs> my God, we've really uncovered it now. And uh, talking to the dead. That's good. She was very into, like, helper angels, like angels, but she also covered cryptids, aliens, ghosts, all that stuff. Oh, but, I love it. Yeah. Well, you guys have to go to Alien Con for multiple reasons we, just to We see missed it. it this summer. Well, we were all scattered. For what you do and for the science of it, you don't need a goddamn thing there. Right. But the hysterical <laughs> thing, we went to the big coup d'etat on the last thing, and it's all... 
Christian fundamentalist trying to get the timeline right with a world being 6,000 years old and ancient aliens. Uh, yes. Like yeah. the three or four. Of mission. It was so awesome. goddamn hilarious because after the third one, they're like, yeah, we're not really here to work with you on your biblical timeline. <laughs> well, I understand that, but if Leviticus, if you have that it's 4,500 years old and they're in the Mayan temple building, and you're like, no, 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 it's not our deal. And it's these guys that they kind of made their little deal with the devil of their super famous famous and up there at alien con yeah. but seriously it's a giant pocket this show's huge with christian fundamentalists and I gotta, they're all mm. trying to work through the timeline wow. it, it's i've never been more interested in a topic <laughs> uh with people that i have less in common with yeah and that's that's when it comes to me with <laughs> the paranormal and i and there's you know that, that's just the way it is there's that theme park that they created too like a creationist theme park oh, where they God, have like kentucky they have like the people walking along the dinosaurs and they, they you know it fits the whole timeline no, my uh, uncle fred's perfect. been he's a he's a <clears> jew for jesus Right. Yeah, and trying to convert, and which just really means you're pissing everybody off. Yeah. Yeah. Uncle Fred has pissed a lot of people <laughs> off. Like nobody's like, huh? Cool. Oh, yeah. Come no. on in. Hey, you're having your cake and eating it too. So, <laughs> no, they're all pissed. What is a Jew for Jesus? <clears throat> My friend who's Jewish uh, growing up would talk about this. Is it? Is it uh, a little left of center? What? 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 Are, what I, are we th- I about think here? it's probably right of center because well, he's also at the biblical mm-hmm. creationist park, and he probably point. just couldn't afford a ticket for Alien Con. Yeah, but no, it's people that are Jewish and Jewish in their tradition. He like fought, he left Medford, Oregon, like fighting the Israeli military. Wow! But then he's decided he, Jump over on the there Jesus bandwagon. that Jesus is the Son of God okay. and started right. preaching to the Israeli military, which led him going back to Medford, Oregon very quickly. <laughs> right, yeah, right. And then he's kind of taken like that, that message much. and crescendoed. He's got a okay. brand. He's now got a brand. In, 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 in Oregon, and it is pissed off it many works. face. No. <laughs> but it works better in Oregon, maybe. Yeah, than, maybe it's yeah. fringy. It's fringy. Um, <laughs> I finally watched uh, the uh, Netflix documentary "Behind the Curve." The Flat Earther. Oh, yeah. oh that. wow. Dude, that good. Eric, Bryce, you guys have it's good. got to watch it. I've I seen knew it. you'd seen it. Oh, <clears> you've yeah. seen I've it. I've seen it. Eric, you've got to watch really? this tonight. Okay, it is done. Fascinating. It is. It is. It is. I don't even. I, there, there are no words for it other than I, I, I genuinely loved every person in this movie. Oh, I love it. That being said, it is so amazing the length people will go to to just refuse to believe the truth. It is the most in denial of anything I've ever seen, and and you know the uh, and this isn't really a spoiler, but I kept thinking because the the whole philosophy behind it is if I haven't seen it with my own two eyes, it doesn't it it's not real. So uh, I look outside, Earth looks flat to me. It's flat. <laughs> You know, uh, perfect philosophy. Sure. I, I kept waiting. I kept thinking this, watching this whole film is like, take one of these guys or gals up in a fucking rocket and show them. Yeah. Take just. I thought the movie was gonna. Space How about the guy that X built a rocket? Them. I mean, these oh, yeah, some of great. these guys are relatively smart and uh, and 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 quite capable. There was a guy; it was on the news. He literally built a rocket in the desert, shot himself up so that uh, he could prove flat Earth. Uh, came back down in a parachute, bro- broke a few bones, and uh, but this guy literally put himself in a rocket yeah. to to try yeah. and accomplish it. It's an amazing story. I recommend a Google. There are for a lot it, of but- people doing scientific <clears throat> experiments to prove that the Earth is not round. And so far, <laughs> talk about none misplaced of- energy. So you know? far, yeah, they go to this <laughs> elaborate. The there's this amazing scene in the movie where they like buy this like very expensive gyroscope, and they're like, if uh, if. If the Earth is round and we're rotating at this speed around the sun and rotating on our axis, it the gyroscope should say it's X, Y, and Z. And then they do it and they're like, the gyroscope said it was X, Y, and Z. Oh, okay. All right. We got to <laughs> yeah. run this a few <laughs> yeah. more times. Yeah, no, and then again, too, they come up with these very clever experiments that disprove them. They're like, there's something wrong with they're the like, experiment. Oh, the gyroscope right. fucked. Yeah. yeah well, the, the, I like the one reaction, too. There, he was just kind of like a long pause and I was like, huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Guys, so Earth is round. Uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. Now, Eric, we ask our guests Please. the same question every episode. What is your personal paranormal history? 
Personal, I got chills when you asked me that. I don't know. Well, I grew up in the Northwest where, you know, it's very much, if you were to ask a Sherpa about the Yeti, they'll just tell you, of course it exists. So for us... You're we, from... I'm from... I grew up in Vancouver, Washington, which is like across the river from Portland, Oregon. Wow. But we would camp in Cougar, which is just known that Bigfoot's there. And, I, you know, I think he's an interdimensional shapeshifter, or I, I don't think they leave the bones out. Like I said, We're before gonna I knew just Bryce Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but if you go to Cougar, and Mike, and it's in the shadow of Mount St. Helens, yeah. which is really amazing. Everybody up there just knows Bigfoot exists. And so I've always kind of believed, and it was, it was wonderful for me as a kid when, like, Twin Peaks and X-Files came on. Because it went right to my soul. Dude, I bet. Because it's this weird Northwest weirdness that and we Twin just Peaks, have And Twin Peaks, the show, is in Washington State, No, that's right? it. Or is it Oregon? I think it's Washington. It's in, it's in Washington. I remember I was 12 years old, and I was just like, holy shit. Because it tied in, like, you have those synthesis of conspiracy theories in your head and all this other stuff. And I just believed. And I was listening to Art Bell every night. And I think I listened to Art Bell every night for seven years until my roommates in college banned me from listening to it because I thought <laughs> Y2K was going to happen and the oh, world was wow. going to end. My, yeah. I don't think I told you this to Morocco because I wouldn't even think I was cool. My <laughs> parents and my roommates from college had to band together and would not list, let me listen to Coast yeah, to Coast. Coast, Coast, to Coast. My mom would and check in with Mike, Mike Nielsen. Mike, can you just take the radio out of his room? He really <laughs> thinks Y2K. Because Art would scare the shit out of me because you realize sure. now he was such a wonderful entertainer. Yeah. Well, I just don't see how these computers can possibly make it. But, <laughs> yeah. Guys, this is happening. Meanwhile, really? he flies to the Philippines and lives oh, there yeah. for the rest of his life, primarily. Well, after Ramona, yeah. Mm. Dude. <laughs> The universal, uh. yeah, but I mean, I loved and worshipped at the altar of Coast to Coast AM, yeah. and I just have always loved it. And I've never seen an alien or a UFO craft, but I really, really want to believe. Yeah. Um. Lately, I'm extremely intrigued by DMT. I've not tried oh, DMT, wow. but I'm very, very intrigued. We've because told, this there's is a new movie out there called Psychonautics. It's a documentary by a comedian named Sean Moss. Dude, Shane Mouse. Shane Mouse. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who I, uh, well, I really uh, bond with this guy because not only did he broke both of his heels, uh, ah. but he's big into like psychedelics and, and psychonautics. He's been on but, the Duncan Trussell Family Hour yeah. podcast a ton over the years, and I always listen to the Shane Mouse he's episodes. Amazing. He's fascinating. He also did suffer from a massive uh, emotional psychological Yeah, psychological he called it breakdown. a euphoric manic breakdown. He basically did DMT so much and probably was self-medicating. I was just him. listening to this on the way over. He did it about no, 100 wait. times. See, it's all would you try right? it? Or I know, you're right. I think I would. I have Let's somebody that would take me... I'm in. I, I have somebody that would take me through it. Yeah. But it's just that so many different people have done it and had seen the same thing. Right. And I have a I have a friend that's like graduated from smoking weed, mm. and I was just I'm like, what do you <laughs> mean? That. What do you mean? Graduate? Here's your award. <laughs> yeah. That's well, that's his whole thing. He's like, well, weed's like level two, right? And then you go on, <laughs> and I I've, you go on, yeah. And this and is then, really uh, giving uh, armament to those gateway druggers out there. That <laughs> it are really like, is. Weed's yeah. gateway drug. <laughs> but <to> DMT, <laughs> yeah. like I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? But then I mean, it's it's definitely very intriguing for me, and I do kind of think there's some veil. of of consciousness that is tied in with DMT. For sure. And yeah. I do know for me that the the limited times I've done psychedelics with, with just psilocybin, I have done some of the best thinking of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no way. Th this is why it's always so funny to me that the religious crowd wants to ban mushrooms because I've talked with atheists that have done mushrooms afterward and are permanently they've changed. They've come like, to God. Yeah. They've gone to at least an agnostic form mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where at least of like, well, I felt something. And I know for me, and I am a spiritual person, and I just straight up feel it. And I've had like, feel like you get like knowledge or something. Like I used to kind of slouch. And then the first time I did mushrooms, like walk tall, son, walk tall. Wow. Right. And I yeah. quit slouching. Wow. And so I'm definitely more in favor of that stuff than like alcohol. Oh, and oh, I yeah. think it, it's, it's consciousness expanding, and I'm extremely curious. But I do Let, want to try DMT less, just to see, like wow. less recommended for recreational use, though. That's <laughs> no, why, yeah. sure. That's yeah. why alcohol is so popular because it, although it kills so many people in one form or another, it is uh, under the you know right circumstances very recreational. You know, there's you don't get a lot of enlightenment while drinking no one has ever had an epiphany while drunk it's just meant to be 
apes hanging around being, <laughs> well, being well, monkeys, eating rotten fruit. You know? yeah. Well, that's the whole idea yeah. about psychonautics and and like in taking these these crazy psychedelics is that you gear up for them. You actually like ready yourself and prepare yourself like you're traveling to outer space, even though you're traveling to inner space. And the idea is is to bring something back. So not just go there. <clears throat> but go there and get something, find information, uh, get intel, and bring it back, you know? That's and that's, it. that's how most of these guys that are, we really respect who talk about these things, that's how they approach this subject, you know? So they're not just like weekend mushroom takers. They like, you know, uh, they do it once or twice a year and they gear up for it and they, you know, they fast, they they prepare for it and they take it very seriously. So, th- so that, that's it. And and I also think with mushrooms, because I'm, I'm a, a, a you know, of excess leads to the palace of wisdom mm-hmm. kind of guy okay. mm-hmm. and i tend mm-hmm. tend or tended to be excessive and of course the first time i did mushrooms is like holy shit i know what i'm doing tomorrow night now <laughs> when, <laughs> right, and then you're, my, nothing happened yeah. when, when yeah. was that how old this were you? was god oh i'm a late bloomer mike probably even at, way after i met you probably like 33 34 mm. I, I was like went to catholic school and was like very much a late bloomer so like six years yeah uh, <laughs> i'm 42 Oh, the, okay. the age we lost Elvis Aaron Presley. Oh, yeah. But yeah, probably eight eight years ago, maybe. I think it was actually on my 30th birthday. Wow. I went out with two psychedelic 40-year-old guys that were like going to walk me into what it was like to be 30. And I think that was actually it. And cool. I definitely felt changed from it. And then one of my favorite musicians is this guy, Particle Kid, Micah Nelson. He records on the name Particle Kid. I know him. You know Micah? Yeah, I've worked with him. He's the awesome. I love that guy. greatest soul ever. Yeah, Have you heard amazing. his song, Everything is Bullshit? Yeah. Well, Neil Young has, he, he plays with, he and his brother play with Neil Young. And one of the highlights of these shows are Neil Young turns it over to Lucas Nelson and Micah. And Lucas plays this wonderful song called Build a Garden about turning off the news and building a garden with your family. Micah and plays this song called Everything is Bullshit, which sounds like it would be a negative song. It's not. Yeah. It's all about Terrence McKenna's stoned ape theory. Love it. And once I, I, I heard the song, and then luck, luckily I'm friends with Mike and got to talk to him about it, and he blew my mind. I didn't know about Terrence McKenna's stoned ape theory, but it makes all the sense in the world to me. And what's the stoned ape theory the, the, for the those The stoned ape theory, for those that don't know, is that there is this period, and you guys know more about this, so fill me in, yeah. but that there's this period where archaeologists found no weapons. And they're like, man was not at war during this time. And there was also a weird climate change at the time where they think psilocybin mushrooms grew very freely. And at this time, man was just eating mushrooms, loving it, loving each other, no war, and really ascending consciousness and probably took man to a higher form of consciousness Mm -hmm. than we were at before. And this song, Everything is Bullshit, is the most glorious song. And I've seen roomfuls of people that don't want to hear Willie Nelson's kids play. They want to hear Neil Young play. Be transformed by these two songs, back to back. Like I saw him, like real nerding out here. But I saw him in like Port Chester, New York, the day of the Kavanaugh hearing, where it was a lot of hippies really, really down. Yeah, yeah. and these so songs many were, sad hippies. So yeah. many sad hippies. So many sad young people. And at first, everyone's like, "Oh God, we want to hear Neil Young." Not th-. and then it was this magical thing and this magical song. But it definitely, I really do think there are answers in psilocybin. And I think the fundamentalists need to encourage it. It's like you've got atheists doing something and then starting to wonder about God and feeling God. Lean into that, friends. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's incredible. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I, I love his stoned ape theory. Just uh, the idea that uh, it really not only helped. Uh, these you know hunter gatherer societies develop language and communication but it was really the start of these religious ideas you know what i mean the development of of their deities of like god and things no like that way. yeah so, no absolutely and so is that why so much is similar with the different religions and stuff yeah i mean this wow. is once they started taking well the idea was that these you know these early primates these early humanoids they came out of the trees and of course they were you know foraging through the forest and they would take these uh they would find these psilocybin mushrooms and it increased their acuity of 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 edge detection of lights of like sight and sound so they became better hunters so once that was happening they were like able to you know move into a uh 
uh, you know, a kind of a group society and, and became better hunters and then started developing, uh, communication, uh, you know, actual language. And then from there it just blossomed into, you know, there's a book you should read and- Eric called, uh, <clears throat> supernatural by Graham Hancock. Yeah. It's a great one. You'll fucking love this book, dude. And it's all about, uh, DMT, psilocybin, ayahuasca. Yeah, he walks you through and the them all. roles that it played in societies that had shamans who would go on these trips, communicate with higher intelligences in the jungle, and then come back to their tribes and their villages and teach them what they learned. And he discovered that a lot of the trips would often mirror based upon like old paintings, like cave paintings and stuff would mirror um, alien abduction cases where there was something called the pierced man, that a shaman who had become enlightened was also known as a pierced man because in that trip he was taken into the sky pierced with lances by higher intelligences and that basically operated on, like we hear in modern day, alien abduction being cut open and stabbed. And they would have this cave painting of an individual with like lances through him. And mm-hmm. you can find this all over, especially like in the Amazon. Yeah, it's and very strange. It was kind of, that was a rite of passage. So once you had been through that ordeal, you were basically now a, uh, I don't want to say christened because well, it's, it's not Well, it's a death and rebirth motif. But you would have been, you know? it, it is, but it's also like now you're at the level of shaman where you're like, I passed my Jedi trials and now I'm actually like a Jedi master. <laughs> um, it's, you know, Every, like, everything you know, back Wars, to Star yeah. Wars. Well, <laughs> all right. That's amazing. Yeah, dude, it's you got to read this book, uh, Supernatural by Graham Hancock. It's one of our, it's one of the uh, Bigfoot Collector Club, Bigfoot Collectors Club, like, must read. Re- yeah, it's on our, but must, speaking must of read DMT list. too, there's also a great book by Rick Strassman called DMT the Spirit Molecule. Which is uh, mm-hmm. an incredible book about. He did these, you know, these first government Do we not have trials. It on the shelf? It's, it's in know. here somewhere. It might be in the stacks. <clears throat> but he was a uh, he was a professor out of New Mexico State, I believe. But he did one of the first government funded trials on on DMT, and he had about twenty five volunteers that he uh, he gave them DMT uh, intravenously in, in in prescribed doses. But what he found, and he was he was uh, an agnostic about all this stuff too. He had no idea what the findings were going to be, but he became rather perplexed when his volunteers started describing the same entities uh, over and over again. And they kept meeting these same deities and these same entities. And and it it really perplexed him to think that, holy shit, uh, perhaps this is what these, you know, ancient mystery societies have been telling us about for so long that this is a spirit molecule, you know, that puts people in touch with higher planes of reality and not just higher planes, but with also sentient uh deities that that perhaps uh dwell in these alternate dimensions yeah crazy yeah wow i've Uh, I've done it one time and um it's unlike any other drug like it's it's a separate thing i almost like put it in a different category like and we've sort of been like teeing this up forever for me to talk yeah, about it. Yeah, dude, I love it. Let's talk about it. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. What did, <laughs> tell us about your DMT experience. Okay, so um, I decided. Dude, so excited. <laughs> I decided that I was not gonna try to find it. I was just gonna let it find me, and when it found me, I was gonna do it. So I was playing a show in Sacramento, and it was funny enough. It was the day that I, I think it was 2011. There was this like this Christian group that was saying this was the the day that the world was going to end. Do you remember that? There were oh, billboards wow. up all over LA. Oh yeah, this happens a lot. It was like May twenty yeah. first, something like that. So that's something. how I can remember what day it was. But it was that day, which is just a funny side note, right? But so we did this show, and then we met someone after who was a friend of a friend, and he said he had DMT, and would we like to try it? And I was like, well, I guess this is it. I guess this is the day I'm going to try it. So we go to the south. I have no choice. <laughs> yeah. I said, I, kind of yeah. I said, if it finds me, I have to forces me. I put it out into the, yeah, into the world. So I was like, well, that's it then. This is the time. So we go to this house, and it's like a small group of people, and everyone's like doing it one by one. You guys are smoking it? Yeah, you're smoking yep. it, yeah. So it comes my turn to do it, and I... Is it like hash where it's like a paste? It's... Or is it like uh It was like a... The like a rock, kind right? I had, yeah, it was like, rock, like a hard thing, and it tastes awful. It's gnarly and it smells weird, but so I like I took my my hit my inhale and I, you know, I breathed it in and right at first I'm getting like even just thinking about it but right at first like it it came on really heavy like kind of like a psychedelic panic 
Wow. Where you're like, oh, this is too much. This is too much. This is not good. This is too much. And then, and you kind of have to like let that subside. And I've been there on mushrooms and acid before. So I, I recognize that. And I'm like, okay, no, this is okay. Like, I'm, I'm okay with this. This is fine. I'm fine. And then the, the way I know to describe it is like, if this is like reality, I'm holding my fingers up together to form a solid. It's mm-hmm. sort of like everything went like that. And I could see the gaps. What's right. that? You're, sh- you're doing I, then, your hands. I then lined the fingers up so that you can see through sort of the fabric of this dimension. And then, okay, so what? Just for because it's a visual right, description, it's hard to explain. Take yeah. your two hands together, put your hands in between, create a solid, and wall. your fingers in between each hand. And that's the reality you're looking at, and then line your fingers like a, up, like two Thanksgiving turkey. Yeah, hands. Like, yeah everything exactly. comes together, and then line up the hands, and you can see in between the fingers. And yeah, and then so, so then I sort of become aware of myself in this this um, a continuum of dimensions, I guess. And so then the first level of that that i went through was what felt like this mythological realm and i started looking around the room at all the people that i was with and they all took on the character of like a different animal whatever that would be so like like fawns and bulls and like so it was like sort of like minotaur centaur i'd be a minotaur so you're going into the collective of consciousness basically yeah that's what it felt like yeah so that was that first level and then i was in that level but i was still sort of conscious of like this world this reality i was still in my own vision but i was like seeing it completely differently wow then from there that same kind of like wave came up on me again of like oh no it's happening it's coming again this is too much and then you got to really just like calm yourself and be like no this is enough i'm fine and then i left out of out of my own vision and then i was in sort of just this like expanse this this space and i came to meet this like consciousness Mm -hmm. um and it was a non entirely non-verbal communication and Funny enough, I almost brought it up the other day, but when Adela was describing the Watchers, yeah, that was what I felt like I met. It was this, it was this being, and it was like, can you physically describe it? No, it had no form. Mm-hmm. It was just like a thought being, but it was not. It wasn't sinister or dark, but it wasn't friendly either. It Chaos was, neutral. It was very serious and stoic and strong, and it it and it sort of just like gave it communicated these ideas to me about about the passage of time and like dying and death and that it's this it's a renewal wow. and that you know you, you fear the pain but the death itself is not it, it, it's only just like a part of a continuum basically yeah but that also like there is no escape like that is 100 percent what's going to happen and and it was very matter of fact about it and not which like, i hope you did already know yeah, I did. I, well, yeah, it was a, it was a surprise. Riley's, like, <laughs> Riley's in his trip. He's like, yeah. I know that. Yeah. Oh <laughs> it was it was this thing where it was like this this thing. It really and it felt so much that it was not my mind. It mm-hmm. was another consciousness that I was communicating yeah. with. That was sort of just getting me okay with my own mortality. And um, that's so wild. And then it, I'm I'm kind of just in this space, and then I just sort of suck back down, like through the layers, and then back, and I'm back into the room, and then reality comes back together again, and right. the walls back up. And how much time had passed? Maybe eight minutes. Yeah, they say it's relatively yeah. quick. Quick. But when you were in there, how long did it? Because what my A buddy said, the freaking out, he's like, I felt like I was in there for centuries. Yeah, wow. it, yeah. And I'm like. That's the word that's key, kept me from doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Centuries, friend. Really? I could mean, it maybe may, meant hours? Yeah, no. I'll hundreds do, yeah, and hundreds another, of years. I'll do a two <laughs> like, hour layover. Yeah. Uh, maybe. But anything longer than like if I had to be yeah, specific, Avengers Endgame, I don't know if I want to. Maybe be like six hundred and twenty seven yeah. years, I think. It, no, it really was like it was it's like a timeless space. Yeah. Like you have no way of measuring how well, long you were. Some in people there. would say that's the fifth dimension which, which exists out. Outside of time itself, and it that when like we talk about that. eternity, that's what we're talking. What about. What I love though yeah. is you just got right down to the to the juice of it all. What it what happens after life? What what is what is the cycle of life? And it's just like on your one trip, you went right to the source to say this is how life works as a human yeah and and this this being like i, I feel like I'm not, I'm not doing justice trying to describe it well they say it's... words are uh, or are, well, are ineffable they can't you can't describe these feelings i was know? gonna say have you encountered anything in fiction science fiction literature or in reading about this stuff that made you go uh, like you compared it to the watchers but anything that you would go Oh, this is what that was like. Is there anything out of like pop culture even that you could compare it to? 
No, no, but that the description of the watcher was the the closest th- thing I've ever heard it described. Wow. Where it's this, um, it's all it's just an, like an omnipresent, yeah. and it, it exists beyond emotion, and it's it's neither frightening nor comforting. It just like it is, and it's ultimately powerful and same. Yeah. Man. And then I remember I coming, I came back out, and I remember distinctly like what I s- said to describe it. I I said I feel like my spirit got pulled out of my body, yeah, and like dipped into water. And like scrubbed and then just wrung out wow. and then put back in. And I was wow. just like, I, it's, I mean, honestly, it's stuck with me since. Like, but I remember a life being, changing trip. Yeah, euphoric after it. And just like, you, I you feel, were euphoric after it. Yeah, absolutely. So you would be so a proponent of trying it once. I, yeah, I mean, it was a dangerous now, to say do careful. drugs on the radio. Yeah, but, let's yeah. be careful. <laughs> um, I had a very positive experience with it. Drugs are dangerous, and if you're going to do them, do them responsibly yeah. and know what you're doing. And I'm, you know, I can't say well, this to w- do it. If you'll know if you, if you should do to it. piggyback off that that was graham hancock's uh Dude. you know was saying <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah the unspoken in this room is i'm doing it gentlemen <laughs> right but that we should have sovereignty over our own consciousness and if these if these i if these ideas and these tools help us to convene or to commune with uh maybe just our higher selves but something other higher than us then we should have sovereignty over that you know who is the government to be able to tell us that you know um don't do this and and don't do that you know if, if if something puts me in touch with uh you know with higher realities and and uh you know commune with the higher gods as they say then i should be allowed to do that yeah i mean i really will say it's the one and only time of like a drug experience where i felt like i was communicating with something that was not just my own consciousness mm-hmm. you know and that's the strange strange part is yeah. is so many people be like no these are just this is just neurochemistry doing its thing uh as part of a near-death experience which and it very could, well be. could be I feel, I feel like we're all like young boys who are <gasps> like talking about sex without ever having sex like <laughs> one of us had, totally. one of us got it's true. like it's dude, true. Dude, dude. What did it like, smell like, like bro? Shit, man. Like one of us got a hand uh, job in this smell, room. Let me yeah. smell and your pipe, man. Let me like, smell your pipe. <laughs> the rest of us are like, what do boobs feel like? Interdimensional hand it's job. It's so yeah. true. Not to be gender normative. I'm just saying. It's so true. I'll tell you this. I'll like. tell you this. I've never smoked DMT, but I do feel that in my life, I've had a spontaneous emission of uh, endogenous DMT. I believe it, yeah. In a load, because I have felt and I have experienced that same thing you're talking about, and I know it didn't come from pot. Um, I think I've I think I've done it. I think I've had stuff s- similar to that, even not drug-induced. I remember one time, Eric, I think you'll like this. I, I, re- I remember one time I was falling asleep, and I tend to get, I told you guys last week, I had like weird, I tend to do that thing where you close your eyes and you start to see visions behind your eyelids. And I was doing that really, I said that last week. And of course, like Adela private messaged me on, uh, <laughs> we can't have one episode now where we don't bring up Adela. I know, but, this is important but to the she, show. But, but she, <laughs> she is sort of our uh, spiritual guide of, our, uh, of the show now. Uh, but she was like, Oh yeah, that's how it kind of started for me cuz she keeps trying to push me privately to like explore some of this stuff and I oh. keep telling her I'm too scared to. But anyway, <laughs> but I remember I was like I had this moment and this is back I used to draw a lot and doodle and cartoon more and I remember like having this moment where like I was sort of asleep, I was drifting off to sleep, but I was seeing like almost hallucinogenic images in my in my mind. It wasn't dream. I was conscious. And I remember seeing like little like pen and ink looking cartoon drawings that were like uh you know like Windsor McKay or like old n- newspaper strips. And I was looking at those panels and then those would zoom out And they'd be part of this larger, like, column of intricate, like, every square inch of this stuff is a separate, different cartoon drawing. And then that zoomed out, and that column was a leg on this massive, celestial, like, giant that was marching through space and time, composed of cartoon images and cartooning and the message i got was like oh this little drawing this little thing 
is such a massive form of communication that it has its own God that represents its manifestation here in our reality. And it was like a fucking, this thing wasn't like a Mickey Mouse thing. It was like a warrior. It might, it was like built like Thor or like Odin. It had a fucking ax and a hammer. And it was like, boom, boom, just marching through. And I was like, oh shit, this thing has been around forever. And it is so strong. And it's so impactful. And this is like before... You know, those horrible stories of like cartoons in France that got people, you know, massacred and all that stuff. But you just, you would go, well, why would a cartoon have so much power? But you think about it, everything, it's a visual form of comics and, uh, you know, comic books, comic strips, political cartoons, animation, all this stuff. It is, it's like music. It's its own. And there was, I don't know why it happened that night, but it was, it was such a strong visual image that I felt like I was re- downloading some sort of image, uh, some s- s- type of message for no, for no particular reason. But I was like, Oh fuck, this is like a real force to be reckoned with. Strange. Sounds awesome. sounds like a, the ultimate, like stoner <laughs> rock music. Video. It was. And yeah. I wasn't yeah. even high at all. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, just kind of going off to sleep and it just sort of like, I just had this like image come to me. And but I think sudden- it's like going off to sleep or like if you're sick or sometimes the stuff can just sneak through. Mm-hmm. Without yeah. Well, we naturally DMT. produce DMT in our brains. Yeah. So yeah. I think it got, sometimes we get flushed with it and it just I completely unlocks. agree. These spontaneous emissions because they, the, the, the scientists or these you know re- researchers. You know about spontaneous emissions. I sure you? do. Hey! 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 <laughs> <laughs> but these, what do boobs feel like? <laughs> these, re- these researchers feel that uh, you know that this gets emitted during REM sleep, and that our time of birth, and that in time of death. So those are the really the only the prescribed the time of death. You get a bunch of at it. the yeah. time of death, it just unloads, and so that's, that's what cool. these, that's what this near that's death nice experiences are. The there, yeah. yeah, exactly, and. Uh, you know, but anyway, yeah, it can. Uh, there's there's good reason to think that it could also happen, like at you know when you're not expecting yeah. it. Yeah, um, crazy shit, man. But oh no, the 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 studio ghost just showed up. I know, I love because they're they know we're about to talk about yeah, some shit, man. Our, our, literally, the wires just started See? talking. To they us. know. <laughs> Military industrial complex is undefeated. Oh yeah, we were going to tell us about. I would <laughs> undefeated. Hear, we're we're, we're going to take. Under, a, well, Bryce, hold on. Hold, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to hear about this secret bunker. underground Laurel Canyon bunker. And we're going to play a little game called "Bullshit or Believe It." We'll be right back with Eric Edelstein. Awesome. Yay. There's a house near here. Yeah. That Jerry fucking Schilling was dating Myrna Loy, or sorry, Myr- I think her name is Myrna Ray. Yeah. One of Elvis's backup singers. Yeah. And they just couldn't live together in Memphis. This was not done of, of a white man. So Elvis went and bought him a house. Yeah. And yeah. endorsed. He's like, I-, I-, I love you guys as a couple. We're going to get your house in Hollywood because I'll kill you in Memphis. Amazing. So he bought him a house that Jerry Schilling still lives in. Yeah. Still lives in. Incredible. So Bryce and Eric are hitting it off. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Leave them alone There's for only one, one minute. King. Talking about the There's king, man. King, That's friends. exactly right. That's I didn't oh, know yeah. that, I did, uh, Bryce, I didn't know that your horseshoe uh, ring is an Elvis reference. Well, it's a, yeah, he loved horseshoe rings, which we were just talking about. I wear it on my wedding ring because I asked my wife, I was like, I'd love to get a horseshoe ring. And, and she got me this one for my birthday, and it's been... In place of my wedding ring. That's ever your wedding since. band. Well, I no, I so. got I got my wedding band at home. I wear this as the as my wedding band. Dude, that's so. My, my wife was cool with me doing a horseshoe, an Elvis horseshoe room for wedding, and my mom was mortified right, and right. would not let me do it. And now I think we're going to re- <clears throat> reconnect that, Mike. Yeah. As, as we as we care less about external opinions. Yeah, there that's you go. right. I think my mom vetoing the horseshoe ring. Oh, Light and love to Marion Edelstein, but I think we got to get a horseshoe ring. Amazing. Yeah, you know Paranormal. What? Yeah, love Elvis. she'll get it. I'm she'll so death glad. is inevitable. Death. Get, <laughs> there you go. My friend learned horseshoe ring. I went and found out you're all gonna die yeah, but isn't that. it weird though and this is something about being 40 and then it weird it is weird being 42 because that's the age elvis died and i yeah. don't feel 42 i feel young but boy does it creep in more and more of like jesus we're gonna die yeah, i'm gonna yeah. die yeah. yeah there's gonna be i'm gonna die it's <laughs> yeah, a weird yeah. weird thing to wrap your head around it yeah. really is that's that, pretty much what we're here to do right that's yeah. the, the thought that wakes that. me up at like 3 30 in the morning and i'm like <sighs> 
Oh boy, really? It's, okay, yeah. About this <laughs> yeah. Right now? It's uh, good yeah. to grapple with your mortality. It's completely healthy on, on a conscious and mental level too. I fucking mm-hmm. wrestle my mortality in the yeah. morning. <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna put in a suplex. Shirt <laughs> yeah. that mortality <laughs> off. <laughs> <sighs> so, Eric, you yes. were yes. telling us about some mysterious bonkers in these no, Hollywood Hills. I, I'm so excited I get to talk to you about this because this is, it's your neighbor. Yeah. Wow. Do you know, we're talking about the Air Force in Area 51. There was an Air Force laboratory, the Lookout Mountain Laboratory. What? Right here in Laurel Canyon. Really? Off of Lookout there? Whoa. Right here in Laurel Canyon. It was originally top secret. They would have all kinds of Hollywood people that would, if you were in like the reserves, you would come and you would go to this bunker and you'd record propaganda movies. This is in World War II, obviously. This is World War II and post-World War II. More post World War Two, actually. Was it supposed to be like a hip house? Did it look like the like bunker in like <laughs> Lost when you go down there and it's like all shag carpet and stuff? Yeah, it was a lot like Sundance. Was it, yeah, it was like it was one a... of those theme houses. Like this is the Hollywood life, and it's, it's a, a chateau. It was an Air Force pop. up It was an Air Force pop up, <laughs> tastefully done, artisanally, locally sourced food. Right, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> but. They processed the footage from the first nuclear bomb test there. Oh, shit. Shit, shit got dark. So, I mean, truly, Whoa. and people would come in and do these propaganda movies, and everyone did it. I mean, you Google this. What kind of propaganda movies? Anti-war, Just anti-drug? Anti- or? No, pro-war. Pro-war. Oh, this okay. is what you do, That's and they were for the anti-commie. military. Mm-hmm. Military training videos, but you're talking about like Jimmy Stewart, Marilyn Monroe, live fact check me if you want to pick up a computer but you look at this stuff and every single person came through and it was originally called the lookout mountain laboratory and you look at these old videos and it says lookout mountain laboratory at the end wow and so then they decided that was too dystopian so they called it the lookout mountain air force base no way and then it eventually it was a, a functioning air force base in laurel canyon Tons of speculation that there's secret tunnels in the caves, that this was going to be the bug out place, that in case uh, uh, nuclear Armageddon happened. That we got to get to look out, Marilyn. Right. Oh, we'll get to look out. We'll yeah. go right there. Yeah. Yeah. Marilyn, we'll make it. We'll look. invite the stars, too. They'll be down there with us. Anything you want, Jimmy. Next time I come on, I'm going to tell <laughs> you about good. Jimmy Stewart's cryptozoological connections. And there are many. But for now, Jesus Christ. I'm dead serious. I'm yeah. dead serious. He was in bed with we a guy We had to listen Tom to Smith. Riley's dumb DMT story. I know. No, that DMT here. story just pushed me over the edge, and I'm very grateful for it. Woo! And of course he knows Particle Kid. <laughs> but yeah, it was a fully functioning military base that eventually got shut down, I believe, in the early 70s. Then it, it became a private residence. About 10 years ago, it was mm. a rehab facility. Oh. People would pay fifty grand a month to go there. God, we have to find expensive. out the secrets. Yeah, I know. I, I know. thought you were going to tell DMT. me Charles like, Manson was like, dude, I blew a... all my money well, on drugs. Charles Manson, <laughs> Neil Neil Young tried to get him a record deal. He went to Mo Austin and tried to get Charlie a record. Well, not deal. even Neil Young, but uh, uh, Dennis uh, Dennis Wilson. Dennis Wilson, yeah. which I love the Dennis Wilson because I'm totally non confrontational. Of like, I'm just gonna leave. I thought you were. I'm gonna, gonna yeah. leave my house. I'm gonna let Charlie and the family stay. I'm just going. It's <laughs> yeah. theirs. Well, they all he's they all realized that ultimately he was super crazy, and once they had had their fill of. Weird girls and LSD. They're like, oh, this guy's kind of yeah, crazy. Yeah. Doris Day's son, Terry lived, Milcher. Yeah, Terry Milcher lived in the Sharon Tate house and moved with Candace Bergen. Candace Bergen hated Charles Manson. And so when uh, Charles, Charles sent the family out to go murder someone in a random house, he thought it was uh, Terry and Candace in that house. And instead, Sharon Tate and uh, had moved in. Uh, and with uh, why am I blanking on the director's name? Uh, Roman Polanski. Yeah, Roman Polanski. He and, was in Europe at the time. And Jay Sebring, the Hollywood hairstylist of the stars. Yeah, his partner. They opened the first male hair salon in town. His partner was Larry Geller, who, who just Elvis me hired about. away. Yeah. And because Elvis hired him away, he was not murdered. Wow. I was yeah. going to say, I thought you were going to tell me that Charles Manson was grown in a test tube in the uh, Lookout Mountain Laboratory. He well, might have started a new conspiracy well, theory. Now, that's where, if we really want to delve into this, and I'm going to start by saying I don't believe this. I just think it's fun to talk about, as so much of this stuff is. Yeah. This is turning out to be a very epic night here at Big Book <laughs> Well, yeah. because it's all the magic. When, when, I, for when two I, hours? I got chills. 
when I first came to this area, I would just be driving through Laurel Canyon because this area is so magic to me because of the art. And because of Joni Mitchell and Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Seeped in history. Harmonizing together in a, in a house right by here. But do you guys know the conspiracy theory about all those hippies and all the hippie artists? I have I've heard this, yes. It's and, amazing. People one. have brought it up be like, you're a new, you're a new crop of the... Yeah, I'd, I'd love Which, to hear uh, you explain you the look whole at thing. You're, you're also uh, a <laughs> For, Nephilim, according to everyone at Contact in the that's, Desert. That's true. I think you might be as well. What is that? Uh, the ancient giants. The ancient I biblical we giants. Totally are. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. We totally are. I'm willing to come out. I'm an ancient biblical giant. You know, well, Goliath, Goliath was a Nephilim. was a part BCC Nephilim. Exclusive. For those who don't know, what's the, what's the canyon hippie conspiracy this, this theory. one i love so basically if you want to talk about if we're just going to start with crosby stills and nash which is kind of the nexus of the laurel canyon sound okay in the shadow of this secret military bunker that allegedly has caves and tunnels that are still there and possibly still being used cool we're saying this now by the air force well part of the magic of crosby stills and nash is their sound is unlike any other steven stills is bringing in all kinds of south american rhythms mm-hmm. louisiana rhythms well why does he have all these south american rhythms because his dad was going around spreading democracy with the military industrial complex. David this is why Disney made Saludos Amigos and Three Caballeros, because they were trying to promote business in South America. Dude, yeah. promoting democracy. David Crosby's father. David Crosby, the ultimate hippie guy. David Crosby's father is Floyd Crosby who is in the OSS, Mm. and his dad is a cinematographer that eventually would win an Academy Award. His dad shot High Noon, but his dad learned how to shoot because he shot military stuff starting in 1930. And in World War II, he shot all the bombs dropping. When you start to delve into this shit, there is an absolutely shocking amount of musician parents who were in the military industrial complex. This is David Crosby or Stephen Stills? Both. So, I'm just, just going to throw this out here real quick. Give me more. My 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 dad's a high ranking Air Force officer. Yeah. Oh. And my my dad uh, my dad was a uh, naval officer. <laughs> there we go. So we're, in, uh, ah. I was on uh, so Alameda what, Naval Base. What year? And I was in Patuxent River Naval Base. If you look on IMDb, I'm the only person born in Patuxent, Patuxent River. But oh. it's an extreme covert. So maybe I'm a disinformation. I'm like, I you guys you even. I I could I could well maybe be. we maybe we well met because before. that's what I wonder about. Let me see you guys shake hands. We have a giant hand. Shakes, man. That's what I do. I looked in. I'm like, I know this. They man. just stared at one another's eyes, and beams of light came oh. out. You're not allowed to say that. Man. You signed a confidential. That edit that out. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Oh, edit that out. Guess Our yeah. naval fathers Guess will come who's in. Guess in charge of this whole operation? God. My friend, Mike, take one lesson away. The military industrial complex is undefeated. Wow. <laughs> now, how about another one? Jim Morrison, yeah. and I love Jim Morrison, and I will fight for the doors, and I think every person now... I do think Jim Morrison's a huge douche, but I... and I, But, okay, so maybe we can get to the douche. X's. Total douche. When you were 16 years old, did you love the doors? Of course. Well, here's my problem. Every person that says Morrison's a douche and rips Morrison loved him in high school. Well, that, but that's because you're a dumb kid. But he brings you to rock and roll. True. And then you betray him later. You get... But then when you're an adult and you look at him, you're like... Oh, he was just kind of a douche that, like, I Why was, was he a douche? It's not meant for adults. It's like a Bukowski well, kind of. He's you know, like, like a like self-important. A... Like he was That's trying art, to be. Bro. He was trying to be cooler than he actually was. Well, he's the, a douche. He's American a poet or an Irish poet, but but I say this. I I think his music is for the unformed sixteen-year-old mind. Yeah. And that's also why I'm big on not trying weed until you're in your mid twenties. That mind is unformed. But that Morrison and the Doors are strong, strong medicine. For a person just coming to rock and roll, mm-hmm. Jim Morrison's dad. This is why we call it the personal paranormal please. history. It's very <laughs> shockingly personal. <laughs> Jim Morrison's dad. I'm about to blow your motherfucking mind. Is Admiral Steve Morrison. If that wow. name sounds familiar, it's because he was the man in charge of the ship during the Gulf of Tonkin raid that started what? the Vietnam War. Whoa. When you look at more and more and more of these incredible hippie artists, their dads were deep in the military industrial complex. Yeah, that makes sense, though, too, just like that 
that's who that's who would become the hippie rebels. Also, they're yeah. super you know, privileged. It's not they're, a all, they're all white. They're yeah. all super privileged. They come from money. Their family settled out on the West Coast or East Coast, right? And yeah, and they're probably rebelling against their like yeah, all that big navy fathers. money, all that big giant. <laughs> yeah, money. yeah. No, but Shit. I mean, it's like they're strongly middle class in that era. Yeah, I in understand. that time era, yeah. you're making money. Well, yeah. and who was the first person to if put that forth the JFK conspiracy, if you want to call it, on a national stage? David Crosby in 1967 was filling in for Neil Young, who left the Buffalo Springfield on stage. You have to see this footage because it's hysterical. He's in the middle of a concert. He's like, hey, dig it, everyone, dig it. I just want to tell you something really quickly. It's pretty good. At Dealey Plaza in 1963, there was not one gunman. There were multiple gunmen. This was a turkey shoot. And he goes in this whole thing on stage while <laughs> oh these musicians God. are raging, trying not to swing their guitars and hit him in the face. Yeah. But maybe he was a disinformation agent, or maybe he well, was betraying the parents. He was also probably oh. reading, they say that a lot of the early JFK conspiracy stuff was printed by the Russians in zines over in like underground uh, magazines and stuff in, by, by the Kremlin. No but put, way. put through uh, the communist underground so it would spread to the United States. They planted those early conspiracy theorists. Little in, apropos in, ver- in today's yeah, seriously, no, but dude, dude, this, this is why this is why if you actually take a minute and do a little bit research on all this Russian disinformation and fake news shit. Yeah, don't be lazy, BCC listeners. No, 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 no. I'm saying <laughs> they they've been doing this. Yeah. For decades, for 60, 70 years, and they are way better at it than we are. This is why this is why it, it this is why they're popping champagne corks and drink and toasting to one another when oh. Trump won in twenty sixteen. Because it's like a real thing that they do they're much because they know Again, what did you say about the military industrial complex? They're undefeated. Yeah, so you got to figure out but new ways. Maybe actually they are defeated to Russia's you, but, military complex. But you industrial have complex. to you have to come up with new ways. If your guns and bombs aren't going to invade a country, you have to figure out new ways invade to do the it. Mines. And when you're a totalitarian government who wants people to think that democracy doesn't work, you start spreading shit about democracy that makes people doubt it. That's so they were doing yeah. this with the JFK conspiracy. All that JFK conspiracy shit traces back to the to you just the, blew my to mind. the KGB. That's crazy. Well, shit. and this yeah. is, and I just want to throw so this it's out very, there. But it's very likely that through the underground, oh yeah, cool shit. David Crosby got a hold of some of that material and did exactly what the Russians wanted him to do, which is start spreading it on Facebook of his day, which Amazing. was He's the Ed Sullivan Russian, show. He's he wearing is. a Russian hat and shirt at the <laughs> yeah, time he does this. <laughs> no, for real. I'm not kidding. Are I, you really? serious? I saw the documentary there yesterday. Oh there you go. Wow. There you he go. was there. Not to there name you go. There you go. drop. There you go. Wow. Wow. Also Tarantino. I'm chasing the old hippies. <laughs> Wait, what, what was It's the... called Remember My Name, oh, yeah, David yeah, yeah, Crosby. Yeah. We got to go see this. phenomenal, amazingly honest. Y'all will, y'all will love it. I've seen it. Well, there you fucking go. My point's proven. Holy shit. Well, the other thing, and I just love you saying this because I sometimes feel insane that everyone is fighting about whether or not Trump colluded and is just okay with the fact Russia swung the election, where it's like, well, in actuality, he'd be the last person you'd tell. Yeah. And, and that guy said on t- live TV, crash your emails. But this is a little bighorn. This is an all-time military victory for all time. Yeah. For a minimum investment of, what, 800 grand of people in a, in a warehouse? <laughs> Pennies. And I read, and I would highly recommend Ben Jacobs' book. He was Obama's number one foreign policy advisor. <laughs> and he was there at the time, and he's like, you got to tell me. He's like, what am, what, what am I going to do, Ben? Am I, I'm going to go on Fox News and say Russia's trying to take the election? That's exactly what they say Obama's going to do. So I, I don't know oh, what you wow. could have it's like done. Checkmate. But wow. it truly is. It's like a, it's the little bighorn of our life that Russia yeah. swung it slightly and they didn't. I was sure it was going to come out. They fucked with the Diebold voting machines. No. They well, they fucked with t- people's brains. They also did try yeah. to hack into voting machines. Couldn't well, they got in and I think they realized they didn't need to because yeah. they fuck with people's brains. They're doing it again. And when I look now, already in the Democratic primaries, how horribly people are fighting. Yeah. yeah. That's and bad. people don't realize that the Bernie bros they were fighting with were Russian bots. Oh, yeah, they were. And I'm like, this is going to happen again. Yep. And it really, it's like one of those conspiracy theories that actually happened. And nobody wants to talk about. It. Nobody wants to admit that, like <laughs> Russia put our president in. Yeah, just swung it just enough. Just I don't enough. think he's in that sense illegitimate. I don't think there was any illegal votes. 
They fuck with people's minds. They're going to do it again, and we're not doing shit. It's the internet, guys. The place you're <laughs> right, listening right, to this price is crying. That no. Bigfoot <laughs> that happened yeah. in Oregon. Well, it's the Navajo <laughs> web. I fully believe the, Nav- the Navajo <sighs> web and the Navajo prophecy they talked about. They What's talked the about Navajo this web? evil web of energy that would take over the world and that the Navajos would somehow have to come in and help and save oh, society. Oh, I've heard oh, this. Come back yeah. and help us, please. Wait. Dude, wow. please. And, is, and I believe it. This and, also and, sounds like the indigo children stuff a little bit, too, where like this, there's a generation of special kids that were born around... 1997 like it, or you know oh. like harry potter's representative you know fictionally of one of these indigo children luke skywalker sort of is too. Star seeds. i want to believe yeah. i want to believe star children uh, is you know, i meet thing. some of these kids and they're ascended and i'm lucky because I do, I do these cartoons and you meet these 23 24 year old just geniuses that are on another level and they're so sweet and they weren't raised with bullying or in less abusive parenting, mm-hmm. they're kind of magical, and I want to believe it. I think I, when I hang out with Mike and Nelson, I think he, he could be an indigo. He's, yeah. he's an ascended being. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I want to believe. We need we, we need help, friends. Yeah, because right now it's a it's a it's. I'll tell you. Crazy. I'll tell you what we do. Everyone get registered and go vote in every election. If you just show up and vote, only forty two percent of our electric show. Electric, if we could just win that popular vote, just go. <laughs> oh wait, just go vote. It helps and vote. on the way. Vote however you want. But go vote. Go vote. Wow. And check your sources. <laughs> just from take it from a podcast. Well, did you see that the, gets all yeah. of their information <laughs> off paranormal websites? Yeah. And check your sources. But that's what's so funny to me because I'm I'm an unabashed conspiracy guy and I love all of it. And then there's this giant thing that. It's not a conspiracy. Yeah. Russia swung the election for yeah. a president. And nobody talks about that. They're trying to figure out if the esteemed Donald J. Trump may have had a, a play in it. It's like, yeah. that's the last person you Meanwhile, tell. one really of his is. best friends is like busted for uh, a child sex ring. and <laughs> That's a whole other second. Dude, I read that. Meanwhile, yeah. we were like, pizza gate. <laughs> All yeah. right, guys, uh, we're gonna play so a game with Eric. Alienated half of our listeners. Oh, and, uh, you know what? Let you go, what, guys. Deal with it. Yeah, we're still deal friends. With, deal with it. It's all good. We're talking about ghosts and aliens. It's fine. Um, and besides, I've listened to a lot of your bullshit, and I still come back. I also for, have. Yeah. I, for me, I feel like I'm always doing it wrong in life if I don't have a lot of Republican friends. Totally. So I have tons of. I grew up ton- in Kansas. No, I have tons of Republican friends in yeah. Spokane, and it's very interesting. I keep hearing, and I know it's not a po- politics podca- podcast, I keep hearing from Republican, never Trump friends that are fascinated, love Mayor Pete. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah. It's really, really That's interesting. Cool. Yeah. It's it's nice. very interesting. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll right. see. But yeah, cool. we should all be friends. See, I just got our uh, alienated brought, viewers back. You brought them back. There I got go. tons Come of friends. Come on back, everybody. Let's, let's talk That's about it. Yeah. stuff. That's it. <laughs> they, uh,. <laughs> They come for the Bigfoot stories. They stay for Bryce Johnson. So don't worry. We're not losing anybody. Oh, yeah. Sexy, sexy Bryce Johnson. Oh, thanks. I'm trying to like uh, exploit you and bring it back yeah. to Yeah. Yeah. Rugged, back, handsome. Back, yeah. I'll take it. Fuck it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> sure. All right, guys. It's time for a game that we call Bullshit or Believe It. I'm going to go through a list of things. And if you believe in it, you're going to say believe it. If you don't, you're going to say bullshit. You only have Whoa. those two options. Great. Count on if you're you, somewhere Eric. on the fence, use your acting skills. Yeah. Oh, I will. All right. This is how people pull one thing out now and like. Yeah. On your mark. Cartoon Grizzly Bear. Sir. Ready, <laughs> set, ghosts. Believe it. UFOs. Believe it. Bigfoot. Believe it. Angels. Believe it big time. Gnomes. Believe it. Unicorns. Bullshit. Shadow people. Believe it. Loch Ness Monster. Uh, believe it, but I think she's passed away, sadly. Little gray aliens. <laughs> it's like a qualifier. Believe it. We're going to have a... Uh, we're going to get an Academy <laughs> Awards in memoriam. Yeah. <laughs> Loch Ness Monster. The end of she lived a wonderful <laughs> life. Served others. God bless Their perceptions were terrible. <laughs> Nessie loved it. I know that I won't have to use the uh, layman's term for this. Alien Greys. Believe it. Dogman. Bullshit. Parallel Universes. Believe it. The Loveland Frogman. Believe it. Mermaids. Believe it. Heaven. Wow. Whoa, Bryce. Believe it. Put your dick back in your pants. <laughs> Excited. <laughs> Wait believe till it. Riley and I are gone. Heaven. <laughs> I believe in heaven, yeah. It Hell. Can be, it can be on Earth. Yeah, unfortunately. I, I don't believe in devil and... Or, sorry. We'll come back. Yeah. We'll come back. Hell, hell can exist, but it's on this planet. Yes. Believe it. Yeti. Believe it big time. Venusians, a.k.a. Hot Blondes from Venus. I don't know that one, so I'll say bullshit. 
Yes, because I'm a modern safe. American. Oh, okay, <laughs> chupacabra. Believe it. I own one. I brought a dog back from Puerto Rico that's a quarter chupacabra. For real. <laughs> Do you know about Valiant Thor? No. Oh, okay, that connects to the Venusian stuff. Uh, demons, Atlantis. Believe it. Bat Squatch. Bullshit. Dude, that's from your home state, Mount Rainier. Is it Rainier. really? Yeah. What's Bat Squatch? A Sasquatch that's what it sounds like. like nothing. Flies. It's a bat? You don't need he, to they know. They think he erupted out of Mount St. Helens. Yeah. Oh, shit. Okay, I take it back. Believe it. Life on other planets. <laughs> believe it. World peace. I believe it, and I think it's coming. I think helps on the way. We're in the middle of a pendulum swing. All right. Eat peace in the multiverse. Believe it. Okay, great. Great awesome. job. Good awesome. job. That Let's give good. it a little yeah. applause. Yeah. 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 That's how crazy I am. Uh, that was amazing. <laughs> You just believed in like one thing less than Bryce. You're in good shape. You did good. Um, yeah, you did yeah. good. Yeah, man. Really good. Uh, okay, angels. <laughs> really, angels. Really you good. said. Fit, <laughs> angels. You said believe big time. Oh yeah, and I told this guy, and I'll say, I think, I think Elvis is an angel. Mm, I, think I love he can that. Help. I love what it. do you mean? Man, I think he's here to help. I read this one book. I love that. That Elvis is. Uh, you really love Elvis. Uh, well, I just think. I mean, that's. Yeah, I think the veil's thin with him, and I think okay. I think there's a thing with Elvis. I yeah, I think more. angels are real. Third most okay. recognizable person on the planet: Jesus, Santa Claus, and Elvis Presley. Yeah. God um, bless him. Heaven and hell. That's a band. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I I believe in. I mean, I, I guess it's like defending your life. I think we have lessons to learn in this life, and you're trying to ascend. So I'm hoping to get things really right in this life so I can be like an alien next time. Right. All right. Or ascend it. And I don't believe in uh, the devil necessarily. And I, I don't believe anybody goes to burn for 800 years because yeah. I think even horrible acts are affected by nature and nurture. Yeah. But I believe absolutely hell can be on earth. And look at how many people we run into in this business that have <laughs> what we dream of yeah. and they're miserable. And yeah. I think it's their own weird private hell. Yeah. I mean, I'm at I least agree. in limbo for sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to say it. But yeah, you're at least in limbo. <laughs> I don't Come have, on now. Half as much as what those guys have. <laughs> um, uh, oh, Dogman. So you got you to gotta get into the Beast of Bray Road, the Michigan Dogman. You got to read the works of Linda S. Godfrey, my friend. <laughs> I'm mean, going home I, with a summer reading oh, list. I'm ready. I, I, <laughs> I was a non-believer, too, and now I find it. I don't know what the fuck it is, but it's It's always back. I want to believe. Why, yeah. why wouldn't you? It's so right. easy to be a skeptic in this life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to believe. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that 100%. Well, I want to believe whatever bullshit Bryce is going to share with us next <laughs> on our High Strangeness of the Week. We're going to take a quick break, and Sounds when we good. come back, Bryce has a story for us. Awesome. <laughs> All right, uh, so before I start my story of high strangeness, I had some inside intel on a new paranormal ranch uh, that ha- just happens to be for sale. Uh, so as I Googled the ranch to, to research it, uh, this is what came up. You know, folks, I've been selling real estate for over 20 years. This next property that I'm going to show you uh, is the most unique property yet and it's near vernal utah it's a 160 acre paranormal hot spot that's right ufos <laughs> north of the famous skinwalker ranch folks look that up skinwalker ranch has a department of defense funded project at that ranch that's the blind fog ranch is 160 acres of paranormal activity <laughs> and there's abnormal occurrences every week on and around this property that I'm showing you. The activity has been documented by well-known people and government agencies. <laughs> now, folks, they found uh, things in and around this property that only the owner will discuss with you as a serious buyer. If you're interested in a property like this, hey, give me a call. Not a licensed real estate agent. <laughs> Blind, Blind Frog Ranch. Yes, dude. How great is that, dude? dude? You have to call. I know. I, know. I've, yeah. I need eleven million bucks. No, yeah. you don't. I looked at. <laughs> you're gonna You're gonna laugh. I looked at Elvis's house. Yeah. On Montevale, and like, they'll let you. She looked, at, she looked at my IMDb page, not knowing that they don't pay character actors what they used to. Right. <laughs> so she I gotta go see that I ranch. Had money, and I <clears throat> probably had six hundred bucks in the bank. Well, and this- it was a. 
$25 million you, house. You got to go look? Yeah, I walked around. Dude. Yeah. This place is 12 miles north of the famed Skinwalker Ranch, and it's called Blind Frog Ranch because as the owner was uh, digging on the property for soil samples, he came upon these these herd, I think a herd of frogs, that just happened to be oddly blind. So it got its name Blind Frog Ranch. And so the same type of paranormal, you know, a Skinwalker Ranch is this ranch in Utah that they call the Paranormal Disneyland. So I can only imagine that, uh, you know, there's this a longer video. This is like video. the paranormal Knott's Berry Farm. <laughs> yeah, it's close. We yeah. do a rough wolf for Halloween. We might not be yeah. Disneyland, yeah. but we are the Knott's Berry Farm. And in yeah. fact, a lot of UFOs, the... Uh, Bigfoots. A lot of the Imagineers that designed uh, Skinwalker Ranch, they actually, after they retired from Skinwalker, they came over here and they, they oh. actually designed some pretty cool oh stuff in the God. 70s over here. So you should check Jesus it out. Jesus Christ. I love that. But That's uh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, we'll put a link to that in our show notes Put for a sure. link to that. That's a juicy. Uh, so, sh- Bryce, yes. it's time for High Strange. Yeah, let's get on we to it. We haven't done one of these in a while with you. Okay, great. Good. What do you got? Here we go. Foggy London, 1837. The sun is set on a small town of Barnes Common as a man's walking by a cemetery on his way home from work. The sounds of the night seem to go eerily quiet as the hair on the man's arm suddenly stands on end and a figure in a cape comes bounding over the eight-foot-tall cemetery wall, lands with ease in front of him, blocking his path. The man squints his eyes to see see a most unwelcome intruder with glowing red eyes, pointed ears, and a devilish grin. He also notices what appears to be a helmet and a tight-fitting white suit, like that of an oil skin, as well as sharp metal claws attached to his hands. The ghastly man then lets out a belch of blue flame from his mouth, followed by what can only be described as a sick, maniacal laughter. (laughs) (laughs) Not bad. Scared for his life, the man bolts past this nightmarish aberration, narrowly escaping with his life. And so was born the legend of Spring-Heeled Jack, the Terror of London. Yes. What year was that? 1837. In October of the same year, Michael, a barmaid by the name of Mary Stevens was walking through Clapman Common when a figure leapt at her from a dark alley and spat a blast of blue flame in her face. The creature then grabbed her and began to kiss her while ripping her clothes and touching her flesh with his claws, which were, according to her deposition, cold and clammy as those of a corpse. Thankfully, her screams were heard and some local villagers came to her aid but not before the assailant leaped onto a nearby rooftop melting into the night. In 1845, in daylight, and in view of numerous witnesses, Jack bounded towards a young prostitute who was crossing a bridge in a London slum. Hello, sir. Would you like me to play you <laughs> the whore pipe? Grabbing her by the shoulders, feel free to chime in in a London voice anytime, all three of you. <laughs> he breathed fire into her face, tossed her into the open sewer below, and watched her drown. This was the only murder to which he was linked. Now, were there witnesses to this? Numerous. Even more strange. I'm not going to do anything. Are you going to do anything? I'm not doing nothing. She's right? drowning right before her eyes. Let's get a job. <laughs> Once he appeared before soldiers at a military base in Aldershot, he was clad in oilskin suit again, wearing a shining helmet, and the sentry fired on him and claimed that the bullets passed right through him without effect. Several sightings would follow. And while historian Mike Dash records that the reports described a ghost, imp, or devil in the shape of a large white bull, the attacks would all share some of the same characteristics. He would usually target women walking alone at night, either by ringing their doorbells and when they answered, clawing at them or leaping in front of them and attempting to assault them or chase them. Most victims described him as a hooded figure who would breathe fire into their faces before he attacked wasn't long before police identified the assailant as Spring-Heeled Jack. Due to his apparent supernatural ability to always escape by leaping tall buildings and rooftops, as the sightings and attacks became more common, his celebrity grew and made its way not only into the minds of the people, but into the London Times as well. One of the more terrifying encounters came in 1838. It was late at night in a village named Old Ford. A girl by the name of Jane Alsop heard the door outside her house ring, and as she went to answer, she opened the crack and could vaguely make out a figure in the shadowy darkness. It looked like a tall gentleman wearing a helmet and a cloak, but it was too dark to make out the features. 
She asked him what he wanted. I'm a policeman, the strange voice said. I'm a policeman. For I'm God's policeman, sake, woman, governor. bring me a light. We've caught spring Jack here in the lane. Jane ran for a candle and went outside and handed it to him. And as the flame lit his face, she saw that the man was no policeman. The light from the flame revealed his hideous and frightful features, eyes that resembled balls of fire and a menacing joker smile. There was no mistaking him for anyone other than Spring-Heeled Jack himself. He was once again donned in his tight-fitting white oilskin suit, and something seemed to be attached to his chest, resembling a lamp. Jane screamed in horror and attempted to run back into the house, but Jack grabbed her with his claws. He tore off pieces of her clothing and hair as he wrestled her to the ground and laughed maniacally, all the while blue flames shut from his mouth as she struggled against him. Hearing the noises outside, Jane's sisters Mary and Sarah came to her aid, and they were able to pry Jane from Jack's hands and somehow managed to drag her away the rest of the Alsop van oh, managed to drag her away. The attack on Jane Alsop was also reported in the Times later that week. The police apprehended a suspect named Thomas Milbank, who had reportedly been bragging about attacking Jane to his drunken buddies in a local pub. I put a bit of phosphorus in my mouth, and I attached it all that to my chest, and then I got a tight fitting old skin suit on, and then I just ravaged her. Well, he you was let. Son, Tom, that's not true. It can't be true. Well, he was let go not only because Jane said he didn't match the physical description, but I'm because, a bit short. <laughs> because Jane insisted that the man who attacked her could breathe fire. If you're him, breathe fire then. Go on. Do it with your mouth. I Tom, do I it. I can't do that, but I can stick a roll of. Exactly, it's not him. I can stick a roll of farthings up my bum. <laughs> Public outrage forced the Lord Mayor of London, John Cohen, to publicly acknowledge spring Jack's existence. However, evidence of Jack's comes entirely from personal, personal testimonies, which can often be unreliable. On occasion, eyewitness accounts of spring did not seem to add up. He was sometimes described by I his like victims. You, I like that you were <clears> testing <throat> that as a first name. Like yeah, the old spring, Springy. spring Hill. <laughs> spring <healed. laughs> I feel like I'm just in a rush, but that's okay. He Take was, your time. Yes. Breathe. <sighs> Fire! Ah! Look at that. He was sometimes described by his victims as being short, tall, black, white. These inconsistencies okay. suggest <laughs> that perhaps... That so-called spring heel jack attacks were not carried out by the same person alone, but by several individuals. Even Lord Mayor Cohen endorsed this theory. He pub- published a letter from the member of the public which suggested the attacks were being carried out by pranksters as the result of a sinister bet. A popular theory was that spring heel jack was the alter ego of a wealthy aristocrat, the third Marquess of Waterford, who was known for his irregular and often violent pranks, and who was in the area at the time of the initial jack sightings. He had earned the nickname the Mad Marquess because of his affinity for wild behavior. Marquess? What's a Marquess? Ah, it's like a lord. Uh, I'm sure you're going to look it up. Marquis? I I thought Marquis, too. The Mad Marquis. How do you spell M-A-R-Q-I-S? Q-U-E-S-S. The Mad Marquis. I like Marquess. Let's roll with that. Marquess. Because of his affinity for wild behavior. Like the time he painted the town red while everyone was asleep. In 1880, an acquaintance accused the Marquess of being Spring-Heel Jack. Marquess or Marquis. Just say it different each time. And yeah, then, you I'll know, do that. Mar? We'll, we'll, we'll Quiz. Hit it for sure. Claiming that the young nobleman employed his wealthy engineer friends to design and create boots with well coiled springs in them, and that the he had taken it upon himself to master the art of fire breathing to amuse himself by jumping out at strangers at night in an attempt to defile and harass them. Uh-huh. While it's true that the initial sightings could have inspired copycats and imitators taking advantage of the public sphere, it doesn't explain the incredible feats that were the hallmark of Jack. Not to mention, the Marquois died in 1859, years before Jack's attacks ended. So you're correct. In French, it's Marquis. In the UK, it's Marquise. Okay. Marquise! Marquise! Or Marquise. Is a nobleman of high hereditary rank in various European garages and in those... Of some of their former colonies. The term is also used to translate equivalent Asian styles as in Imperial China and Imperial as in 
Imperial China. Moving on. China. Wait, we want to learn. Uh, another theory. I'm helping. Is that he was perhaps an alias of a man by the name of Joseph Darby, a world class spring jumping champion. Who knew there was such a thing? Darby had the physical ability to jump great distances and was known to practice his sport at night. In one case, terrified onlookers caught him jumping over a canal in the early morning hours. And like Spring Heeled Jack, he was wearing a thick cloak and a gas helmet to conceal his face. This helmet is okay. Strange. Unfortunately, this also doesn't add up as Darby was born in 1831, making him only six years old when the sightings began. Reports of spring Jack would linger Stilts. for the next 50 years or so, and throughout this time he was the subject of many plays and penny dreadfuls, small comic-like pamphlets that contained pulp horror stories that sold for one cent. That was the name of my first ever band. <coughs> penny Dreadful? Yeah. No Somebody way. was a nerd. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Bizarre theories abound that he was perhaps an alien, or trapped in London, a time traveler, or even the devil himself. Wait, a homesick alien, you say? Yes. One of the more bizarre theories of spring Jack is that he was an, actually a survivor of a UFO crash. The notion originally appeared in the June 1961 issue of Flying Saucer Review, where it was posited that all the details of spring Jack reports could fit in with accounts of an alien spaceman on Earth. His helmet is a space helmet. The weird outfit is a space suit. The devilish appearance is his alien face. And he can jump really high because Earth has less gravity than his home planet. The fire breathing was actually the locals' misunderstanding of some kind of plasma weapon. And hey, <laughs> while you're stuck on Earth for a while working on your crashed spaceship or waiting for your star brothers to come get you, why not let off some steam by attacking and harassing the locals? Apparently, that's just what did happen, because in 1838, there were reports of a fireball lighting up the London sky. They say that was spring Jack's return flight, where he was whisked back to a planet where spitting fire on strangers and tearing off women's clothing with iron claws is perfectly normal behavior. I just want to be loved. <laughs> However... He must have fell in love with our local culture and surroundings because he supposedly returns to visit Earth to this day, occasionally turning up to peer in people's bedrooms windows at night, leap over tall buildings and otherwise terrify the rubes. In 1938 to 1940, dozens of people in Cape Cod, Mass. reported a man who spit flames and jumped really high. In 1953 in Houston, Texas, three Houston residents saw a huge shadowy figure cross the lawn and bounce upward into a pecan tree. A dim gray light illuminated the figure. It was a tall man with a black cape, skin-tight clothes, and quarter-length boots. After a few minutes, the figure just melted away, and his disappearance was followed by a loud swoosh across the street. It was the more like this. Swoosh, a swish, <laughs> a swoosh, swoosh. <laughs> and the rapid ascent of a rocket-shaped object was to follow. Once again in 1979, more than a dozen people in Plano, Texas, said they saw a 10-foot-tall creature with pointed ears cross a football field with a few strides, like a man walking on the moon. With any good Michael story... Michael Jackson? ...involving high strangeness... Legend of Spring Heel Jack continued long after the sighting stopped, and thanks to author Alfred Burridge, he even became a sort of anti hero of the area. In Burridge's fictional stories, Spring Heel Jack was a wealthy aristocrat with a secret underground lair who would don a bat like suit to fight crime. Sound familiar? Superman. Totally. That's the story of Spring Heel Jack. Well done! I love this story. Yeah. This is, I love Victorian cryptids. This one's crazy. I don't know if they just wrote these stories to sell newspapers, but the Alsop case is pretty famous in this, and they <clears throat> were supposedly real people. Yes. This, were, it, it is a it is a well recorded and, and established fact that uh, you know, there were multiple witnesses. It was in and out of the times. He was a real person supposedly to attack it's, real people. It's so crazy. this reminds I mean, this feel doesn't this feel like the Mothman? Doesn't it feel like an early version of Mothman, the red glowing oh, eyes? I never thought of that. The capes, the leaping around, the going, the, I don't know, the terrorizing of, 
there's just something weird about this. This feels very much like we're in the John Keel Mothman mm. um, uh, 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 injured cold territory here for Could me. Be. It's very strange. Perhaps. I also like the theory that it's just a sadistic aristocrat. Just, mm. just yeah. the rich <clears throat> Easy to asshole. See. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. I'm like, yeah, that, that one checks out. Also, right. how do we get away from spring jumping? Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> like, <laughs> so <laughs> Like, how did that not keep going? Well, I want to... And also, pro- why spring was, jumping yeah. on the canal? Why was it, it spring heel jack and not, like, fire mouth jack? Well, because they were, it, it, it was kind of set, buried the lead, you're right. It was yeah. said that a, uh, a police officer, officer discovered one of the crime scenes and, and, and looked in the dirt and looked what saw some sort of, like, spring depression. And that's when the name was actually coined, it's spring heel jack. Cool. Uh, this story is crazy. These are yeah. just a bunch of drunk Englishmen. Yeah, <laughs> well, a- and I... I, and I bring evidence to you video of kangaroo stilts, which is today's technology and still doesn't jump over rooftops. No, you're not jumping uh, over a building with No, that. you're not jumping over anything uh, with that, so. I don't know, Eric. What the hell is that? What the hell was that, Eric? I mean, I believe it. Yeah, good. I want to believe. Good. So put it in the Believe It column. I'll put it in the Believe It column. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Strange, I mean, terrifying. But yeah, there's yeah. just something about the Victorian stuff. And it's yeah. like I went to Jack the Ripper. Did anyone ever try to make it's, a connection? That's the thing. Is that's it all leads up to Jack the Ripper <clears throat> after this. It's it's almost like, it is almost as if the collective unconsciousness of London was dreaming up a real nightmare that was to come at the end of that century. Mm. You know, that they're like, oh, we have Jack the Slug. He's breathing fire. Because no one ever seems to really get hurt. I guess that one woman gets murdered. Yeah. That could have just been some John pushing a woman down a well or into the sewer. But, like, even in the Allsop case, people say he breathes fire in their face, but no one's burnt. There's no... Yeah. And fire breathing was an art that was, you know, uh, a- people were able to do yeah, at that time. Either. So it's not out of the realms to think that somebody could... You got people breathing fire. Right. And you got people <clears throat> spring jumping. Yeah. It could be some sort of weird performance artist or crew that mm. are going around and doing this stuff for sure. I love the idea that it is sort of like a Victorian version of, like, the Joker's, like gang yeah. right. and i do believe the collective unconscious if you have the spring heel jack thing already going and create a jack the ripper yeah, yeah you never know that's crazy we'll have to be careful weird they stuff do. that's why social media is just i think it's creating stuff i think there's one thing that we can all agree on is that eric you need to come back i'm to this so show. in oh, yeah. <laughs> i love you guys yeah. and next time i'll talk to you about jimmy stewart and cryptids great to be continued so all right. i believe it that's a promise um anything that our listeners can Look for you in Until Then. Yes, watch We Bear Bears. We're doing a movie now that'll be next summer yeah, that's on so Cartoon cool. Network. Yeah, and then I think Room 104, I'll be in the new season of that, and I think, oh, sweet, oh, on cool. HBO, yeah? I think it's the first episode, but it is for sure the origin story of Room 104. Oh, cool. Whoa. And awesome. it'll, it'll be a real fun Are one. Are you in this? I know Paul F. Tompkins is in the new season. Are you in that episode? With I'm not Paul? in that episode, okay. no, but I am in it with uh, Luke Wilson. Oh, very wow. cool. So I couldn't believe great, it. Dude. And I, he's real lucky I wasn't able to corner him for a second because I just would have bothered him about being Richie <laughs> Tannenbaum. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it's the origin story it shows. How the hotel got haunted. Cool. Wait, and and are you working true or false? You are working on a podcast. I am working on a podcast. I just started interviewing older people wow. in their 80s called What's the Secret? Oh, good. Because I sat with this guy, Don Murray, who is amazing when we did Twin Peaks. And the whole time I was with him, I was like, what is the secret? So I just went up to Galita and interviewed That's him. That's such and then a great I, idea. Because he was what? like He was this amazing. And the story came out, which I couldn't believe when I interviewed him. He was a conscientious objector in Korea. Awesome. And then they were going to throw him in jail. And instead, he went over and volunteered with war orphans and refugees. Wow. And while he was over there, he saw these refugees and was trying to figure out what to do with them. He came back, got offered a bunch of seven picture movie deals because he was the toast of Broadway before he Most got in trouble. Those were the days. Yeah. <laughs> Those were the days. But he turned them down because he's like, I want to. He's just a bizarre, wonderful thinker. He's like, no, I wanted to control my own movies. So I said, yes well, to Well, we know where I yeah. would. <laughs> oh, I my God. I would so be a. Oh, is this your pen? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I know. I'll just write my name in case you want yeah. later. Like, I hear about people like, no, back in those days, they, they just would put you on a contract, and then you couldn't control the movies you wanted. I'm like, great. Fucking I don't great. control the movies I do now, yeah, and exactly. I'm just not on a contract. I have right. no control over my None. career. <laughs> but I meet people like you, Mike. Oh, boy. But yeah, but so what he did, he came back, he got a two-picture deal, 
And his first movie he did was Bus Stop with Marilyn Monroe. He got nominated for an Academy Award. Wow. It was shit. <laughs> so he uses his capital from getting Academy Award to go back to Italy. He buys land with his wife, Hope Lang, and another gentleman. He buys massive... Were they a throuple? Sw- they, no, I don't think so. They could have been. I, Don's cool like that. He buys <laughs> massive swath of land in Sardinia and gives it to refugees. Oh, my God. And they're Love still there. Guy. Amazing. Wow. The town is still there. It's named after him. And nobody knows about this because he's so humble and wow. wonderful. And it was the whole thing of sitting with him of like, what's the secret? And it's just amazing because he, the, the part he played in Twin Peaks, he was my favorite guest star. And it was written for a guy that was 60. That was an old <laughs> fighter. And Don Again. Murray came in at 86 and did this. So it was just an honor to sit with him. And I think we're going to do a 90th birthday party for him very soon. I Amazing. went and did David's show, that weird one with <laughs> the mountains in it. And then I sat next to this Royal Tenenbaums fan. And he wouldn't shut up. Next thing I know, he's blowing me up. Blowing my spot up. Yeah. <laughs> That's about what happened, man. I was at his house in Galita. And he's like, what's a podcast? Right. <laughs> but he's the coolest man alive. That's and like, right. That's incredible. And it was just that beautiful thing is like we turned off the equipment i look and i'm like you just want to act like you want to you would do anything next next week he's like yeah so i'm like just wrote this scene to shoot with my buddy uh micah and him and i'm like all right we're oh, gonna cool. do this and he's like in and he's, he's about to turn 90 i wow. love that he's that the rules. coolest coolest guy ever and, and i think part of it <laughs> and part of it would made me really want to interview him was he took a massive break from hollywood to like cave dive so he he was like the lead on Falcon Crest, and Dude. he was just over it. Dude, what if next time you go over to his house, you open up his closet, and you see two spring-heeled boots just sitting <laughs> Oh, the you butt. just gave me total chills. <laughs> or the picture of Dorian Gray, because yeah. he does not look his age. <laughs> and it could be like that Twilight Zone where he goes to interview the, the old ingenue. He might uh, be spring-heeled Jack. Uh, <gasps> Dude, I may have made a deal with the devil. I'm okay with it, because I cool. believe in that. Yeah. Love That's great. That. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh my gosh, um, this was so fun, y'all! Yeah, such man. a pleasure. pleasure. Was ours, such man. a great, yeah. epic episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club, yep. kicking off second half of summer strong. We appreciate it, Eric. Thank you, uh, and to you, the listener at home, we thank you. Uh, check out our merch at tpublic.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club. Go check us out over there. Um, we've got uh, what else? We've got. Uh, BCC out uh, the other side, which is our Patreon page where you can hear more episodes for a nominal uh, donation every month. Um, And then, of course, uh, you can always go to Apple Podcasts. Please subscribe, rate, and review over there. I know you might listen to this on another podcast uh, format, but if you go to Apple Podcasts, it's the biggest one in the world. It's going to help us out a a bunch so yep. just go on by you just say one word review just write peaches just go there <laughs> give it five star and write peaches all right that's all you got to do we would appreciate it um boys 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 anything you want to plug before we say goodbye to our friends yeah I, I, this episode was so good i yeah I, i'm leaving it plug free yeah, thank you for sharing your story Oh, yes. yes. That, that made that. it for that me. That's, that's, a, that's a monumental moment and this has been teased out for months which means that bryce yeah. You still have a secret to tell us. Maybe I do. Oh. Maybe I'll come forward. Well, ju- right. Just like I was waiting for the right moment to, to do it, I was waiting for the right moment to tell it, and the right moment came. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And It'll come. It It'll happen. Timing is everything. And hopefully by then, I'll have seen another alien gray in my living room window. Until <laughs> next time, I remain Michael McMillan for Bryce Johnson, Riley Bray. Children, you know what to do. Go get regressed. Good night. Bigfoot Collectors Club is produced by Riley Bray. Our theme song is Come Alone by Sun Eaters, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. If you like the show, please rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps get the podcast to more listeners. To support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock multiple reward episodes every month.